thank you all for standing by. We appreciate your patience, and welcome to today's conference call. At this time, your lines have been placed on listen only for today's conference. During the question and answer portion of our call, you will be prompted to press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Please ensure that your line is unmuted so that you may record your name when prompted to be introduced to ask your question. Our conference is being recorded, and if you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I will now turn conference over to Dr. Henderson. Ma'am, you may proceed. Hello, my name is Jaquiba Henderson, and I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and a medical epidemiologist in the Division of Reproductive Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I lead the state-based perinatal quality collaborative activities in our division, and I'd like to welcome you to the sixth presentation in a series of webinars we are sponsoring on perinatal quality collaboratives. Today's presentation is about neonatal quality improvement initiatives, and this webcast will include a discussion of examples of neonatal quality improvement projects, including project challenges and successes, statewide dissemination, and sustainability. Our presenters today are Drs. Jeffrey Gould and Munish Gupta. Dr. Jeffrey Gould is the Director of the Perinatal Epidemiology and Health Outcomes Research Unit in the Division of Neonatology at the Stanford University School of Medicine and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. He also directs the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative, a network of 127 California hospitals that provide intensive care to newborns that have volunteered to submit and compare uniform care processes and outcome data and conduct quality improvement initiatives for their mothers and newborns. He has also developed an all-California neonatal transport database and the all-California high-risk infant follow-up database until age three that are both linked to the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative data set. He also serves as the Principal Investigator and Neonatal Director for the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative. Dr. Munish Gupta is a staff neonatologist and the Director of Quality Improvement for the Department of Neonatology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center an instructor in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. He is also co-chair of the National Quality Improvement Collaborative of Massachusetts, also known as NEO-QIC, a collaboration of all the neonatal intensive care units in Massachusetts created in 2006. Since 2009, he has coordinated a group of state collaboratives that has been meeting in the context of the Vermont Oxford Network's NICQ series. This group's focus is fostering the development of state perinatal quality collaboratives and exploring the potential of multi-state quality projects. At the end of their presentations, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and participate in the discussion. A recording of this webinar will be archived on our webpage at www.cdc.gov forward slash reproductive health forward slash maternal infant health forward slash PQC. Downloadable handouts are also available and may be accessed by clicking the handout tab at the upper right side of your screen. I will now turn the presentation over to Drs. Gould and Gupta. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what we're doing in uh, California. And I'll give a little, uh, a, a very brief overview of uh, CQCC, although uh, uh, we just heard a pretty nice description of it, and then launch into uh, what we've been up to. So we, we established ourselves as a, as a regional outgrowth of the Vermont Oxford Network in 1997, and we wanted to get a sustainable collaborative network of uh, public and private hospitals really to support a system of benchmarking performance improvement activities uh, for perinatal health. The uh, data center uh, uh, starts off with a CMQCC, our maternal uh, sister organization, with 500,000 births a year, of which we get about 7,000 acute neonatal transports, uh, 17,000 NICU admits, and then about uh, 7,000 uh, high-risk infant follow-up uh, uh, patients across the state per year. 
in each one of these blocks, each one of these data blocks uh, supports quality improvement for that particular aspect of, uh, of the perinatal uh, journey. We're quite uh, fortunate in California to have a, a huge diversity, and uh, this just shows the, uh, that we have a, a number of community, regional, intermediate, and undesignated NICUs uh, we care for, that care for both uh, VLBWs and, uh, and uh, larger infants. And uh, the challenge here is to try to uh, do work that will really uh, uh, speak to uh, neonatologists that work in a variety of, uh, of uh, conditions. Our organizational structure is that we have three major arms. There's a, a data arm uh, that runs the data center. There's a research arm that really looks at uh, research of, such as how best to model, how best to do things. And then there's the quality improvement arm uh, uh, whose work is really quality improvement, and we'll talk about that uh, uh, further. So the a perinatal quality improvement panel is really uh, uh, where it all happens, and it's divided into four sections. One of the most important section is the analysis section, and, and it's great to have a lot of data, but if no one really looks at that data, to figure out where the challenges are, where the quality improvement opportunities are, you've got a, a, a dusty data a warehouse rather than a really dynamic uh, data set that's driving quality change. So our analysis committee is tasked with looking at the data and trying to uh, uh, come up with um, uh, areas for improvement. Once they do that, it goes over to the infrastructure committee and they'll either develop a toolkit or start to develop a, a collaborative uh, uh, quality improvement uh, uh, program. Once we have that, it goes to the education committee. They market the toolkits, and they uh, try to integrate into the annual uh, uh, meeting of the California Association of Neonatologists, which is really well attended, uh, uh, the topics that we're going to be working on. We, uh, we then do the uh, uh, quality improvement uh, uh, project, and then the research committee uh, publishes uh, the results of the collaborative. So there's a, a lot going on, but again, what I want to stress is that it's one thing to have data. If you don't analyze the data, it doesn't help you very much. So the analysis committee is very, very important. There are three challenges as we see it. The first is recruiting uh, participants. Uh, the second is delivering the goods to the participants and to the members in general. And the third is uh, sustainability, cementing the process uh, or moving the culture. Uh, the way we recruit participants is that we go through the data. The, all of our data is confidential. Uh, but we send confidential letters of invitation to all, our, I think we have 132 NICUs, and in those uh, letters, we give them their confidential uh, uh, status uh, uh, against the All California Benchmark. The idea be here being that, uh, you know, you may not know that you're challenged in a particular area, so the letter of in invitation allows you to see where you are with respect to what we're going to be doing quality improvement on, and hopefully if you're challenged, uh, uh, that would give you um, uh, uh, some motivation to join the uh, collaborative. And in addition, we showcase at our annual meeting uh, the projects that we're working on or the toolkits that we've developed. In terms of uh, delivering the goods, we'll talk about uh, uh, that in a moment, as, as well as sustainability. And these are two very important uh, uh, areas of, uh, of, of work. Uh, initially, uh, we started off uh, in, our, in the person who uh, really uh, uh, was important in getting us off the ground was David Wirtschafter. And what we did is we looked at areas of underuse, overuse, and misuse and started to uh, develop, uh, and started to develop uh, toolkits. And what we found out is it was easy to develop toolkits. It was difficult to get people to really look at those toolkits and update them periodically. So one of our huge achievements was not just developing the toolkits, but developing the commitment for folks to really review 
and keep these toolkits current. In addition to the toolkits, we had a series of workshops uh, that uh, included a lot of pre-work, uh, quality pre-work, workshops um, uh, saying what you were going to do and then going out and doing it. Uh, and this was fairly successful. We uh, published uh, the results of uh, antenatal steroids uh, 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 initiative as well as an infection initiative. Both were very successful. But we felt that there, there might be a, a, a more uh, uh, efficient way to do this. And so uh, uh, when uh, Paul Sherrick joined uh, CPQCC, he brought with him the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvements Collaborative QI model. This is a, essentially a one-year model. Uh, uh, the key features are you uh, recruit experts. These experts develop a framework for change. They review all of the uh, current practices to try to put together uh, uh, appropriate change packages. They develop an aim statement and a measurement strategy. <clears throat> we call for participation uh, with letters of uh, uh, and uh, and some uh, word of mouth as well as uh, advertisement. And uh, uh, the folks that uh, join do pre-work, and then there are a series initially of three uh, learning sessions. Uh, and these learning sessions were supplemented with uh, web sessions and uh, conference calls that are usually done monthly. So it's a pretty intensive uh, uh, level of support that's, uh, th that we're putting on for one of these collaboratives. And one of the guiding principles in our work is that each initiative must have an agreed upon uh, aim statement. Uh, here's just a, an example of an aim statement uh, that you can uh, peruse at your, uh, at your leisure. The important thing about it is that it really includes all of the features that are required by the, the Board of Pediatrics for recertification uh, in, in terms of meeting your quality requirements. So these aim statements uh, are not only a directive, uh, but uh, they fit the requirements for uh, uh, the board. They also fit the requirements for publication. So each initiative must have an agreed upon aim statement, and each must submit a monthly process outcome and ba balancing measures. And this is fairly unique, and, uh, and we feel very, very strongly about this. And so strongly that we've gone to the trouble of creating a confidential extranet so that uh, uh, people can upload their data monthly. Uh, they can then get feedback of this, which allows them to build, uh, to, to do their run shots, uh, uh, as well as to produce the, a final run shot that can be submitted to the, to the board to uh, demonstrate uh, what they've done. Uh, and there's usually a, a, a set monthly process outcome and balancing measures. There's a set that everybody has to uh, submit, and then there are some optional ones as well. And the third guiding principle is you must conduct standardized and report on standardized process audits as well. So, so there's a, a, it sounds like a lot, but if you really think about what quality improvement is, if you're not doing these things, you're really not doing quality improvement. At least that's our feeling. So here's just an example of a, a, an extra net, and it's uh, showing uh, it for our uh, delivery room management, which was our third collaborative using IHI. Uh, it just shows you that we're following uh, uh, temperature, and this is for the group, but you would get your confidential uh, 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 individual NICU uh, uh, chat as well when you when you logged on. The next uh, slide is quite important because I think this is the guts of sustainability. Uh, so here in the delivery room management, uh, this is compliance with best practices and we're looking at the percentage of sites that self-report 75 to 100 percent compliance. It's really important and what this does is that it really is a measure of how successful we were uh, in terms of really getting people to, uh, to, to change the way they do things. So, so this, this, you know, paying great attention uh, to uh, uh, best practice compliance process audits 
we feel is absolutely essential uh, if you want to have sustainability. Well, what are our results to, to, to date? Uh, here's a, our first collaborative was on CAPSI reduction, and you know we have a very significant uh, reduction as have most people who've worked on CAPSI uh, uh, have found that uh, they, they've been able to uh, get very impressive uh, uh, reductions. Uh, and here's just a demonstration of some of these reductions. Uh, what's really important is the sustainability. So here's compliance to the maintenance bundle, and by March uh, uh, we had 100% compliance. The reason that compliance to the bundle is important is that you really can't sustain what you have not achieved. So if you're not really doing the bundle uh, at 100%, if you're not really doing hand washing, if you're not really doing certain things that are required at, at a 100% level, the notion of being able to sustain these is, is just uh, ridiculous. In other words, uh, what culture is, is the way you do things. And uh, if you're not doing those things, you can't sustain them. So. So again, we pay a lot of uh, attention as we're doing the uh, as we're doing our QI, not only in in what you're achieving in terms of, of your uh, uh, in terms of your goals, uh, uh, but also what you're achieving in terms of uh, in terms of doing all of the uh, things that you want to do to change the way you're you're working. So. Again, I, I just want to emphasize uh, a lot of people really uh, uh, focus on what you're achieving in terms of results without looking at how you're getting those results. So you could, uh, you could do very, very well short term, uh, but then if you're not uh, at 100% compliance or, or very near it, you really haven't changed the way you do things. And so uh, it's no uh, surprise that when the project ends, uh, you start to fall back into the old way of doing things and, and you lose the gains that you've uh, worked so hard for during the, uh, during the uh, process. So one of the things that we decided uh, with uh, Collaborative 2, which was breastfeeding, is that this IHI model that focuses terrific attention uh, uh, over the first uh, year of the project and then kind of everything stops, uh, it almost reminds me of the, the handoff. You know, you put all this attention in the NICU for a baby and then you hand them off to the community and forget about them, uh, something we're trying to work against uh, to, to change that kind of approach. So one of the things that we decided is that we would put a fourth learning session in to really start to look at whether we're sustaining sustaining our, our gains. Uh, and one of the things we've really been discussing, and it is about uh, this, so this brings us out to about 18 months, is what's the responsibility of a QI organization? Uh, you know, can, should we really stop at 18 months or should we be monitoring for the next five years? And if folks are challenged to, to have a, a, a renewal and, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a uh, uh, a way for them to uh, get back on track. And I think that's what I'm pushing for, and, and again, working with PQIP, this notion that if we put on a QI, uh, sustainability, that we're responsible for sustainability, not just for the QI, the, the, the one-year IHI or the one-year bond kind of thing, but to say if you join a QI uh, 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 project, that we're really going to help you forever. Uh, and uh, I think that, that one of the, the important features of a, regional, uh, uh, of a regional QI organization is that we're hopefully going to be around forever, and so uh, we could uh, uh, adopt a, a forever commitment. So here's a, a, our collaborative on uh, breast milk, and you can see that uh, we've certainly uh, uh, achieved uh, an improvement uh, in uh, in breastfeeding. Remarkably, we've also uh, uh, in the uh, participants really decreased uh, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. And you'll notice that in this particular group, they started off with neck rates much higher 
than the controls. The controls are the CPQCC non-participants. Uh, and during the course of the collaborative, they dramatically decreased their neck rates so that they then, they then uh, uh, met, the, uh, uh, met the rates in the rest of the, uh, uh, of the uh, collaborative. And you'll notice that, that during the intervention period, when we stop the intervention, after stopping the inter intervention, that's that one year uh, very, very intensive uh, IHI uh, uh, monthly uh, phone calls, et cetera, when they were on their own uh, in sustaining that the, that the improvement actually continued. And we, we're seeing this uh, uh, as we look at our data, that, that one of the things that happens is that uh, if things are working well, that at the close of the formal intensive collaborative, uh, improvement continues. So this is a pretty interesting, uh, to me this is very interesting from a public health perspective in that you'll notice that at baseline the participants, although there are only 11 sites, were pretty challenged with respect to breast milk feeding. and, and uh, this is just what we wanted with our recruitment. You know, the idea was to send out letters to tell folks uh, where they were with respect to uh, benchmarks, hoping that those folks that were really challenged would join the collaborative. And we can see that at baseline, these folks really uh, were. Uh, the intervention, uh, uh, during the intervention period, they improved. And uh, during the post-intervention period, uh, uh, when traditionally stuff starts to fall off, according to the literature, uh, these folks uh, continued their uh, uh, improvement. Again, uh, on this slide, we're, we're trying to, uh, again, uh, paying a lot of attention to uh, uh, the various uh, uh, things that, that we feel uh, the various uh, important ways of doing uh, uh, things if you want to have uh, uh, high breastfeeding uh, rates. And here again, uh, we're looking at uh, what folks were doing before, uh, before the collaborative and what they had implemented uh, after the collaborative. I, I, again, I, I just have to emphasize that, that carefully monitoring process uh, is, uh, is, we feel, very, very important to the success of a collaborative. And, of course, uh, uh, here's the paper. And, and, again, we structure our collaboratives so that at the end of the collaborative, we've done it in such a way that it meets all the requirements for publication. Uh, and we feel that this is a, that we feel that this is a very important uh, aspect of our work, to do work uh, that is really structured so as to meet the, the board's requirements and also publication requirements. And here's our conclusion uh, it, it, with respect to breast milk. Uh, we had a collaborative on delivery room management, again, just demonstrating that these things do work uh, uh, and uh, currently uh, things are, that, that, that the latest data shows that uh, it's even higher than uh, 75%. So one of the problems with the IHI collaborative is that it's very resource intensive and cost, uh, cost energy personnel. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, organizational bandwidth, and about 25 sites are max, maximum manageable number for any collaborative. So what do we do with the other 100 sites across the state uh, who want or need to improve but uh, can't or didn't join the collaborative? So in response to this, we're trying to uh, construct a new model using the core components of the collaborative without the travel or extensive data collection, and we call this NICU-QI. And the, uh, the, the, the way it works is that <clears throat> you use a, a toolkit uh, you use, we have uh, QI principles uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, we try to uh, uh, make available. Uh, it's important that you have a QI expert to help you. The QI expert is internal, doesn't have to be an neonatologist. It could be, uh, uh, you know, could be an orthopedist who's done a lot of QI work that could help to, to work to make sure your aim statement is uh, on target. Uh, and uh, then the aim statement, 
statement is sent in to us and we review it to make sure that it is uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, uh, outcome data is sent monthly. Uh, this is very important uh, in that it gives impetus to collect the outcome data. It also uh, uh, lets you uh, uh, meet the uh, Board of Pediatrics requirements. Metrics are sent in monthly. and. Uh, uh, it's important that you have internally uh, quarterly staff meetings. So, so what we're doing here is we're trying to give all the resources in a fairly structured way, uh, but without the intensive IHI uh, uh, model uh, uh, commitments. Well, we did this, and uh, and uh, in our delivery room management uh, uh, collaborative, we had. Uh, uh, 25 that signed up for IHI, but we had another 38 that wanted to do something, and we couldn't. We, we didn't have the bandwidth to put them in the collaborative, so they did the uh, uh, NICU uh, uh, IHI. 65 folks uh, uh, were not uh, uh, involved with this, and we're doing an analysis of the NICU QI uh, improvement results uh, versus the collaborative, and one of the things that we realized is that the NICU QI, that, uh, that it was really hard for people to do this on their own. And so we now have a second model, and the second model is we're actually using a listserv. Uh, we're giving a roster, and we'll probably promote this a little bit more so that we can kind of create a virtual uh, community of learning uh, with uh, minimal expert uh, uh, input from uh, CPQCC, but enough to keep the ball rolling. And uh, this, this is a model that we're now exploring with our length of stay uh, uh, collaborative. Well, what are our uh, lessons uh, learned in our conclusions? I think that the first thing is that, you know, you can't do anything without data. So a formal database uh, we use to identify statewide quality gaps uh, to support our QI work and really to promote uh, NICU participation by feeding to the, particip to the potential participants how they stand uh, with respect to a benchmark. Uh, we feel that the IHI Collaborative is a, is a pretty good model to use, uh, but it has limitations. So in addition to uh, the formal collaboratives that we put on, we're trying to provide QI opportunities uh, to expand our ability to reach all uh, CPQCC sites. Uh, we have our toolkits, and toolkits are available to everybody. Uh, uh, we have downloads uh, across the, from multiple countries as well as from across uh, the United States. Uh, we uh, uh, always uh, have one-day QI workshops uh, at the uh, annual meetings. We're trying to create this new model uh, that would uh, support single uh, NICU QI efforts in a way that uh, uh, really would give them super results and sustainability. Uh, we provide an infrastructure to meet uh, the American Board of Pediatrics recertification requirements. And very importantly, we really provide an opportunity for meaningful participation uh, of neonatologists across California as QI leaders in California. and, and uh, uh, the next slide, which is kind of hard to see, but you can see it on your handouts, is our estimation of the amount of, uh, of work that people volunteer each month. It's enormous. Each of these committees is very, very active, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, that it's not an occasional. I mean, they're, they're putting in, the chairs are putting in, you know, five to ten hours a month, the members uh, uh, on the average of three to four uh, hours a month, and you can see the number of volunteers that are involved. So one of the questions is, well, why why are people volunteering for this? And and we think that uh, we're, we're providing a really uh, uh, exciting experience. You know, a lot of neonatologists, they go through high-powered training. They do great work, publish a couple of papers, and then go out into the community uh, and never really get a chance to talk about their patients uh, except when things go south, go sour. What this does is it gives people to really, as a group, to talk about how they feel uh, uh, neonatology should be practiced and, and to talk about what they've read and discuss, uh, uh, you know, best practices and limitations and resource limitations, 
to really do professional development uh, in a con with peers and not only to talk about it, but then to see this stuff transform uh, into movements that spread across California helping uh, moms and uh, patients. So, so we feel that, that a quality improvement panel is not only important uh, to improve the, the welfare of moms and their newborn infants, but also the professional welfare of neonatologists and respiratory therapists and nurses and all the folks that are involved uh, with, uh, with the care of uh, uh, NICU uh, patients. Well, is this worth it? Well, I think it's worth it. We've put a lot of effort into nosocomial infection with uh, several collaboratives across uh, time, and here is uh, the CPQCC uh, 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 pathway, and you can see that, that uh, this has really paid off. It's paid off uh, in terms of lower infection rates. But these rates are not just rates. These are babies that would have died. These are families that would have been stressed. These are babies would would have uh, had tremendous morbidity. Uh, these are uh, expenses in in uh, uh, in resources, and and uh, so this this decrease uh, is not a decrease in a number. It's a decrease in a whole spectrum of of values for the various uh, constituents. Uh, uh, and stakeholders in uh, uh, the quality of neonatal care. And I think I'll stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. Before we move on to our next presentation, I'd like to remind participants that we do have downloadable handouts. There was a problem at the beginning with the handouts, but they are now available and may be accessed by clicking the handout tab at the upper right side of your screen. Thank you. We will now have our next presentation by Dr. Munish Gupta. Terrific. Thanks so much, Kiva. Yeah. Back to the start of the talk. Great. So my name is Munish Gupta. I'm a neonatologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and I'm co-chair of NeoQuick, the Neonatal Quality Improvement Collaborative of Massachusetts. And I appreciate the chance to, uh, to share some of the work we've been doing in Massachusetts with, uh, with all of you. Uh, Dr. Gould gave a terrific talk, and I think it was, it's hopefully my presentation will be a nice compliment uh, to, to the work they're doing in, in California. I think many of us who have engaged in perinatal quality collaboratives have looked to California as the, as the ideal model, as they were kind of the, the first folks to demonstrate the, the power of, of these regional and state collaboratives. Yeah, some of the themes I'm going to mention uh, have come up in, in some of these other webinars in the CDC series. Uh, I think the main audience for, for my talk will be those folks who are either just getting going, have recently gotten going, or just thinking about a, a state collaborative. Uh, the title is Improving Quality Improvement, the Massachusetts Experience with a Statewide Unital Quality Collaborative. And the goal is to, is to help understand why we think state collaboratives can add to the quality improvement work that most of the folks are already doing. Yeah, I think I'll start with my take-home points. And, and there's three, and hopefully I will make these over the next 20, 25 minutes or so. Uh, first, that regional neonatal, neonatal collaboratives appear to add unique value to perinatal quality improvement. Uh, there's something that these types of collaboratives do that, that other types of QI work just don't do. Uh, the structure and quality collaboratives at the state level has distinct benefits. I think we've seen some of that from uh, earlier webinars and Dr. Gould's talk. And the third point, there's just perhaps the, the most important point, is that uh, even a relatively simple and basic collaborative can still contribute to, to significant improvements. Yeah, a brief review of NeoQuick. Uh, the idea of a Massachusetts collaborative was first proposed back in 2002. And at that time, uh, a fair amount of work went into getting this going. There, there was uh, quite a few neonatologists involved, uh, lots of participants at the state level. I think even Dr. Gould came by to, to one of the meetings uh, to give some advice. And, uh, and for whatever reason, or, or for several reasons, it didn't quite take off, uh, perhaps because the initial plans were, were quite ambitious in, in scope and structure. In 2006, we thought we'd revisit the idea of a state collaborative, and, and this time we purposely took a, a simpler approach. We, we said if, if we can't kind of make a, an ideal organization that has everyone involved, let's at least get the, the NICU folks together to, uh, to start talking and sharing. Our first meeting was in 2007. We've had a couple meetings a year since then. 
Uh, all 10 level 3 NICUs in Massachusetts participate. Uh, nine of these NICUs are members of Vermont Oxford, and, and I mention that because the Vermont Oxford database is, is an important resource for us. Uh, our structure is it's fairly simple. <laughs> we have a steering committee, and that's about it. Uh, the steering committee consists of, of a couple folks from each NICU, uh, and as a group, we kind of uh, make, consider and, and make all the decisions for the collaborative, including from data sharing to issues around uh, publicity, uh, meetings, and, and publications. Uh, over the past four to five years, we've had a gradually broadening scope of activities, which, which I will share with you. Uh, these are the hospitals, uh, the, the 10 uh, hospitals in Massachusetts with level three NICUs. Uh, certainly the hard work of the collaborative and, and the results we've seen are, are due to the, the leaders and, and participants from each of these NICUs, so, so I do want to give credit to all of them. I also just want to acknowledge uh, Alan Piccarillo from UMass, who's kind of my co-chair in this and has been uh, an important partner throughout. So what I thought I would do over the next 15, 20 minutes is, is answer the question, uh, why a state neonatal quality collaborative? And, and what does our experience in Massachusetts uh, do to answer that question? So, so why, when, when there's so much QI work being done by individual centers, individual NICUs, and other types of collaboratives, national collaboratives, Vaughn, et cetera, well, why have a state neonatal quality collaborative? And I'll give you six reasons I think we've kind of teased out from our experience. Now, the first is to generate interest in QI. Uh, the, uh, there, there's lots of folks doing QI work already at their DICUs. Uh, we found great value in sharing this. At our NeoQuick meetings, a uh, big part of the agenda is just to have folks present QI projects they're doing at their own NICUs. And we found that there is a room for this, there's a need for this, and there's value in this. Uh, over the course of our meetings, you've heard about a project at UMass, Reduce ROP, uh, a very impressive line infection reduction project at BMC, uh, St. Elizabeth's who redesigned their CPAP delivery system in order to, to, to promote non-invasive ventilation, a uh, project to reduce IVH uh, incidence of IVH at Tufts, uh, an impressive nutrition and growth project at MGH, admission temp at Bay State, and, and many others. And I think from hearing, hearing the projects, uh, the folks doing the projects get feedback, other folks get ideas, that this has been important, uh, an important role for our collaborative. We took this idea and expanded it a little bit in 2012 our initial meetings were, were just for the 10 NICUs. We decided to, to, to try to extend the, the reach of this QI sharing by having a, a conference, a regional conference on neonatal quality and safety. Uh, this We called it the New England Neonatal Quality and Safety Forum. The first uh, conference was last year in 2012. We had the second earlier this year. And, and this has been uh, well received. A big part of this meeting is uh, poster fair and presentations of projects submitted by individual hospitals. Uh, we've had 25 to 30 projects submitted for each of the two meetings. The poster fair has been uh, a great success, lots of interest, lots of enthusiasm, and lots of good feedback to the presenters. But yeah, so, so that's the first. Uh, what can a state quality collaborative do? Just generating interest in QI. Uh, I'd say the second is to learn how to do quality improvement. I think lots of us who do QI kind of learn it on the job. You, you get some training. But what we found, there is definitely space for for further training, further education in QI, even for folks who are, who are doing it. So at our NeoQuick meetings, we've had several lectures, workshops on different QI topics, things like understanding clinical performance measures, learning from variation. A big focus for our group has been on, uh, on improving the way we use data for improvement, uh, really the idea of statistical process control. Uh, for some of these workshops, we've had outside speakers come in, some we've done on our own. As I mentioned, we've, we've been pushing this idea of, of using run charts and control charts for QI work. At my own hospital, we started to adopt these in several of our measures. This is just one of our control charts on looking at admission temperature that we uh, update each month and, uh, and use this to kind of monitor our work in this area. And, and, and now a number of the units in, in our collaborative are, are using control charts for, for similar purposes. The At This Quality Forum, the, the conference that I mentioned that we started last year, in addition to the posters and project presentations, we have several workshops on various QI topics, including uh, the model for improvement, PDSA cycle, how to do root cause analysis, uh, workshops on statistical process control, and then workshops on lean improvement methods. The, uh, so, so that's the second reason for a state quality collaborative, or, or the second benefit, let's say, to, to help folks learn to do QI. Uh, the third would be comparative data reports. So uh, in NeoQuick, comparative data has been uh, an important part of, of, of what we do from the get-go. And, and you heard lots of this from Dr. Gould as well. 
Um, but we use comparative data to identify differences, uh, stimulate group discussion, uh, encourage folks to review practices, and then most importantly, drive local improvement. Uh, we started we started with VON data, and I think this is one benefit of, of doing this work in in the NICU is is thanks to VON and, and similar groups, we have a pretty robust data set to start with. Uh, for those of you who looked at VON data, uh, you may have even seen a VON group report. Uh, this is the type of report you can get if you have a, a group or a state collaborative. This is any breast milk at discharge for the nine NICUs in our state that are members of VON. Uh, this is back from 2011. And we get this type of report each year and includes uh, the, the full range of VON metrics. And you can see, not surprisingly, there is a reasonable amount of variability in the percent of babies getting breast milk at discharge among the nine NICUs. We, we take these reports, we select some graphs, we show them at our meetings. And impressively, seeing yourself on a graph like this compared to your peers in your state, for whatever reason, seems to have more value than the reports where you see yourself compared to the whole network. If, if you're center F in this case, and you say, wow, you know, we are at less than 50% compared to our neighbors down the street who are 60, 70, or even 80% or higher, it really does stimulate you to go, to go find out what those folks are doing and how you can look at your own practices. Yeah, we, we, we take these, uh, the Vaughn reports and we go one step further. We do ask folks uh, early on in our collaborative, we made the commitment that we would be transparent. Uh, the Vaughn group reports come anonymized. Uh, you don't know, you know which your center is, you don't know who the other centers are. We all agreed that for the purpose of our collaborative, we would be transparent and share uh, which letter belonged to which group. We also share uh, numerators and denominators for these, uh, these metrics. And that allows us to do it just a little more kind of statistically based comparison. This is another metric, any ventilation, uh, by having the actual numbers, numerators and denominators, we can make a, a comparison chart, a type of control chart that lets us identify those that seem at least statistically to be different from the, the rest of the group. And you can see that three hospitals seem to have lower rates of ventilation and one hospital has higher rates of ventilation. At least we hope that these charts kind of encourage folks to, to go look at those practices, particularly if they're one of the outliers. At our meetings, we don't use letters. We use uh, the hospital names so, so folks know who to, who to go talk to. Now we follow up these comparative reports with, with some efforts at practice surveys. We, we don't necessarily go look at charts to find out exactly what the babies get, but we ask folks to comment on, on their typical practice. Uh, this was one of the charts we made as we're looking at uh, respiratory care and BPD. And you can see, again, not surprisingly, that with basically any type of practice you ask, you will see some variation in what folks do. Uh, here we ask about high-frequency ventilation, uh, typical mode for initial conventional ventilation, and whether they do volume or pressure. Uh, ideally, we take the comparative data, we take these practice variations, and that stimulates folks to, to, to think a bit harder about whether their practices are, are what they want them to be. Uh, so that's comparative data. E even just sitting in the same room, seeing the data, talking about practices, and thinking about ways to improve, uh, that, that, that has stimulated a lot of work in a lot of the units. But, but really the, the meat of the quality collaboratives is doing the actual quality initiatives. And uh, so we, we have built from this comparative data to, to actual improvement work. And, and I'll give you two examples. But the first is a nosocomial infection, uh, similar to, to some of the stuff that Dr. Gould presented. Uh, this, is, this was one of our first projects. We started in, back in 2007. Uh, the outcomes we were looking at were uh, any late infection using VON data and then CLABSI rates per 1,000 line days using NISN data. Our approach to this is a little different than what you might hear or might see in other collaboratives. Uh, we took, I wouldn't call it a simple approach, but, but uh, let's say a, a resource, not a very resource intensive approach, uh, meaning we started with transparent sharing of comparative data, uh, as I demonstrated. Uh, at our meetings, we, we discuss practices, identify practice variations. We develop regular data reports to give people back their data on how they were doing compared to the state, compared to national benchmarks. We discuss local improvement efforts, uh, things that people were doing at their own NICUs, and we share the progress. Uh, really, the goal was to, to drive local improvement through this structure. Yeah, this is the type of comparative data that we started off with. Uh, this is any late infection uh, using VON data by hospital. And uh, as somewhat expected, a reasonable variation in any late infection rates. Uh, we did notice in the first couple of years of this project that this variation remained fairly consistent, that, that for hospitals who tend to be low 
stayed low and hospitals tended to be a little higher, stayed higher. The, uh, we did uh, practice surveys to identify variances in practice. Uh, this was just a couple of questions we asked, what skin prep they folks use for, for B lines or, or pick lines. And we weren't trying to say that everyone should do this practice or, or follow this uh, this particular skin prep, you know, unless there was a clear best practice. But it was more just to, to simulate folks to think about their practice if, if they were different from the others. Now, this is an example of, of one of the reports we, we generated. So, so this report, each NICU gets a couple times a year. Uh, this is just a snapshot of, of the first page, but it gives them a number of graphs to show how they're doing compared to how, well, how they're doing over time and then how they're doing compared to the collaborative and to other benchmarks. Uh, the main goal, as I mentioned, was to, to drive local improvement. These are the types of things that we heard from NICU teams that they were working on. A line insertion protocols, dedicated line teams, uh, protocols around line maintenance, uh, improvements to the way tubings were managed and tubings were changed, lots of work on breastfeeding nutrition, and, and a variety of others. And the results, this is a graph I think folks have seen, uh, kind of like many folks, we, we saw pretty dramatic reductions in infection rates. The green line here is the any late infection measure, that's the Vaughn measure, and you can see we went from around 17% as a state uh, down to around 6% in 2012. Uh, the red line is collapse rates per 1,000 line days in this measure. Uh, this data we first had in 2008, and at that point we were around three, three and a half, uh, three and a quarter infections per 1,000 line days, and, and then 2012 we were just over one. Our prelim data from 2013 uh, looks to be just under one. And I think we've all seen that infections will respond to improvement work, and while it may not be a new story, I think it is an important story because uh, one, one thing to know is over this time period, this five, six years, we all know that there, there wasn't you know, major new discoveries in, in how to prevent infections or, or major new research saying this is the best way to take care of a line. Really the focus here was just focusing on your practices, making sure they, they met what your standards were. Uh, this, this was improvement work at the bedside that, that led to this decrease, and this has been seen by everyone who's, who's done this. As I mentioned, our, our goal has been to drive local improvement, not necessarily to standardize practice across the NICUs, but to drive local improvement. In 2011, I'll mention that we did join uh, a national uh, catheter-associated bloodstream infection project being led by Marty McCaffrey and the folks in the North Carolina Collaborative. Now there's up to 14 states participating in this, including California. With that uh, project, uh, we have done some work on, on standardization of practices through the use of insertion and maintenance checklists by, by all the participating NICUs. But that was new for us in 2011. Yeah, I'll mention one other uh, improvement initiative as an example of, of the work we're doing, and this is related to neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, this was a new project for us starting this year. The, uh, there's several components of this project. Uh, first was to improve knowledge around NAS, and for this uh, we, we, we were fortunate to, to be able to partner with the Vermont Oxford Network and their iNICU series, in internet-based NICU quality collaborative. If folks have done this, you know that, that Vaughn, through this iNICU, uh, puts together a series of webinars that really reflect the, the, the best state of the art and the best knowledge possible in, in a particular topic area. We want to increase awareness of NAS among our participants by partnering with DPH, getting some state-based data, doing data audits within the hospitals. A big part of this project is going to be collaboration, just sharing of practices and tools among the NICUs, and then finally, actual improvement work. And for this, we're trying to use the same model we have, which is to encourage folks to develop local improvement teams, set local improvement aims, and then do work in, in, in their individual NICUs or hospitals. Now, this is a list of participating centers, and I put this up mainly to, to demonstrate uh, this is the first project we're doing that uh, extends beyond level three NICUs. So, so this was open to any hospital in Massachusetts that delivered babies, so including level one and level two centers. And out of 50 hospitals that deliver babies, 40 signed up for the project, which we're quite pleased with. And I like this picture because it kind of, to us at least, demonstrates that maybe for the first time we're really a statewide collaborative now, you know, rather than just a level three collaborative. Yeah, just a couple uh, initial slides from this project. Uh, we're still kind of just getting going in the improvement work, um, but, but this is a slide that was uh, based upon our first audit. Uh, this reflects instance of NAS at the participating hospitals from 2012. Uh, we asked folks to pull uh, instance of NAS using ICD-9 codes. This is a, a, a graph of NAS incidents at each hospital per 1,000 deliveries. You can see quite a variation 
uh, which is not surprising with some hospitals seeing 50 to 60 babies per 1,000 births, but I don't think any of us expect it to be that high. You can also see that our statewide average of 17 per 1,000 is, is quite high compared to the last national report of, of 3 per 1,000. I think that's not a story that's unique to us. I think we're all seeing a, a notable increase in, in this uh, entity. We did do a practice survey of, uh, of participating centers, uh, and as uh, we did see some interesting, uh, well, interesting results from the survey. Here's just a couple of questions that we asked, uh, just to, to give you a little example. Uh, where infants with NAS most commonly managed? Uh, some regular nursery, some special care nursery, some in the NICU, and some in the ward. And this did bring up interesting conversations about you know, the value of a special care nursery or NICU for these babies or the value of, of a ward to allow uh, greater family contact and greater rooming in. How often are infants discharged home on pharmacological treatment? Again, uh, more variability than we expected, with some hospitals never doing that, some occasionally, and some always. And then this also brought up interesting conversations. Uh, we, we've asked folks to, to start developing improvement aims for improvement of NAS care at their hospitals. Already there's been a number of, of interesting projects proposed and, and focus areas from antenatal consults to, to improving the approach of universal screening during pregnancy. A consistency of NAS scoring is a challenge for all of us. Uh, one hospital is looking at time to capture as a improvement metric. A compliance with weaning protocols, use of breast milk for, for babies with NAS, uh, skin breakdown, and then importantly, transitions to care following discharge. Uh, finding opportunities for improvement uh, ended up being easier than we thought. Uh, everyone was able to come up with those fairly quickly. All right, so, so I say that's the, the fourth reason for a state quality collaborative, probably the most important reason, but, uh, but, but fourth. And number five, partner with state organizations. Uh, there, there's lots of folks at the state level that, uh, that, that are interested in, in perinatal outcomes, obviously. I think CPQCC was one of the, the pioneers in doing this, of, of building their collaborative as a partnership of, of providers and state-based groups. Uh, in Massachusetts, we, we developed important collaborations with a few state organizations, including Department of Public Health, the March of Dimes, and the Massachusetts Perinatal Quality Collaborative. I'll just give a couple examples of work we're doing with the DPH. Uh, through the DPH, uh, we've developed a kind of a joint goal of, of, of how can we partner a little more in QI, and, and we're starting with this question of how can we use public health data for QI work rather than for public health or epidemiology work. Here we're focusing on population-based improvement. Like, Can we measure uh, quality and improvement at the state level rather than at the hospital level? Uh, two particular projects, uh, early intervention referrals for high-risk infants and rehospitalization of high-risk infants. This is, both of these are based on uh, database that the state already maintains. Um, but uh, our idea was to use that data for quality improvement by kind of combining it with the NeoQuick approach, which is basically look at outcomes by hospital, use those variances to, to drive conversation and, and drive local improvement. So, for example, here's one graph we generated of, of early intervention referral rates for babies born under 1,200 grams by hospital, the, the goal referred within six months of age. I think we'd all agree that the goal for, for this population should be nearly 100% referrals. And quite surprisingly, as a state, we were only referring 66% of these, and with at least some variability in by hospital, and including one outlier. Uh, we need to confirm this data, and I think this is almost too hard to, to be true, but, but if it is true, clearly this demonstrates opportunities for improvement. Uh, you'll notice that this data goes through 2008. This is data we pulled last year. That is one of the challenges of, of this type of work is public health data does generally take a couple of years to, to get cleaned and get uh, finalized into a report. Uh, we're actively working with the state on how we can make this data more timely to, to, to support QI work. Rehospitalization is an important topic for all of us. Here's a graph of rehospitalization within one month of discharge for preterm babies under 34 weeks. Again, we took the state data and just divided it by hospital to get a sense of, of could hospital-based practices influence this, this metric. We do see variation uh, by our control chart. Uh, there's no statistically significant outliers, but nonetheless, there may be something to be learned from the variation that we do see. Uh, so that's the fifth reason. And then the sixth reason that I'll give, the sixth and last, is that it works. Uh, I think you've heard from, from Dr. Gould that, that it works, that, that it was a dramatic result in California. I think in Massachusetts we're seeing some, some good results. Uh, Dr. Anderson mentioned at the start that, that we've been doing some work uh, through the Vermont Oxford Network of gathering uh, a host of state collaboratives together 
uh, supported by these bond meetings to, to discuss what folks are doing in their own collaboratives and how we can help each other uh, further develop that, their, their collaboratives. Uh, we now have around 14, 15 states getting together. Uh, California was an important uh, participant in this group at the start. Uh, other states include Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana. I won't read these all, uh, but, but you can see that, that there's a, a good range of states getting together now. This spring, we all joined the Tennessee group at, uh, at their spring collaborative meeting, and that was a terrific experience. So, yeah, just a couple comments on these. Uh, I won't go into the details of each state's collaborative. I'll, I'll leave it for those folks to, to share their work. Um, but, but we've we've noticed in the course of our, our meetings for the past three, four years, uh, several themes. Number one, many different approaches to developing state collaboratives, different structures, different leaderships, different levels of support, and different projects. Uh, some of these collaboratives have, have formed, like Massachusetts, just uh, a growth out of the NICUs. Others have, have developed partnerships from the start with, with public health agencies or with medical associations, with, uh, with uh, payers, with insurance groups. The leadership might range from kind of an informal steering committee like ours to, to a very uh, structured leadership structure like in CPQCC. Uh, some groups have, have limited support uh, in terms of funding or finance, and some groups have, have developed important partnerships that give them uh, reasonably robust support. And some folks have focused on some groups have focused on neonatal projects, infection. Some folks have focused on perinatal projects or maternal projects. But uh, despite this variation, they've all seen remarkable improvements. One consistent theme is is that every meeting folks uh, show results from their projects, and they're all seeing improvements. So despite the different approaches, despite the different structures, despite the different levels of support, uh, it, it's working almost across the board. So once again, just to review the why a state quality collaborative, I'd say based on our experience in Massachusetts, based on some of the stuff we've seen from, from the other organizations that we've been lucky enough to partner with through the Savon Group. Uh, one, uh, you can generate interest in QI. Two, you can support folks in your state to, uh, to help learn better how to do QI. Comparative data in and itself has a lot of value, and, and in our experience, comparative data among your peers has, has, has the most. A quality initiative, I think, is, is what we all really want to focus on. Partnering with organizations might, might, uh, might have some, some distinct benefits as well, and, and finally, because it works. So just to take home points again, uh, regional quality collaboratives appear to add unique value to federal quality improvement. Lots of hospitals, lots of groups are working on QI, but, but I think we found that adding this layer of a regional quality collaborative will add value to those efforts. Uh, doing these collaboratives at the state level makes a lot of sense for, for several reasons. And then finally, although ideally, uh, you know, a collaborative with lots of support and, and, and a strong structure can do great things, even a, what, what I'd say is a relatively simple and basic collaborative like ours in Massachusetts can still contribute to significant improvements. Uh, thanks for the chance to share this work with you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Gupta. At this time, I'd like to ask the op operator to open the lines for questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your name when prompted so that I may introduce you. Once again, it is star 1. Please ensure that your line is unmuted, and please press a star one and record your name to ask your question. Please stand by for questions. While we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, this is Dr. Henderson. I have I have a question. May I ask a question at this time? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi. So um, my question is more um, regarding not necessarily the structure of a state collaborative, but you mentioned something about regional collaboratives. Were you referring just to state collaboratives, or do you see a benefit to multi-state collaboratives or regions within a state? Um, I can answer that from our perspective in, in New England. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are definitely benefits to a state collaborative, uh, particularly the partnerships with the state organizations. On the other hand, there are some states, even in New England, that have you know, small numbers of, of NICUs or small numbers of hospitals that deliver babies. That there is value in this. I think this comparative data is, is an important piece of this. So for a region like New England, where we have states with only a couple delivery hospitals, having them be part of this regional collaborative can, can be important and can be valuable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
We do have a question on the phone from Trudy Esch. Ma'am, your line is open. Thank you. Um, I was just curious about your um, iNICU NAS in your state in Massachusetts, and I was so uh, pleased to see that you had 40 out of 50 of your hospitals mm -hmm. participating. In Michigan, we are also doing something similar, and we invited our um, level one and level two hospitals par to participate. We have 83 birth hos 84 birth hospitals, and we only got uh, we have 20 NICUs, and all the NICUs are participating. But we only got about 10. Well, we started with 15, and we dropped to 10 level one, level two. So my question is, how did you go about recruiting your um, other hos your non NICU hospitals? And I'm hoping to learn some lessons from you. Terrific. Thanks for the question. And, and uh, we, we, we've, we've spoken to some of the folks in Michigan about this project uh, quite a bit, so, so we're excited to partner with you guys. So, yeah, yeah, I think we, we, were, we were pleased with the response in Massachusetts. It, it, uh, I think part of it might be that there were, NAS unfortunately is an entity that lots of folks struggling with, so it wasn't a, uh, a small problem for, for anyone. Um, part, of the, part, part of the reasons I think we were... A, we, we had this degree of participation in Massachusetts. Uh, I'll mention a couple things. One, luckily we're a pretty small state geographically. Face-to-face uh, -face meetings are going to be a big part of this project. We have two per year. And so asking folks to come to a meeting in Massachusetts is, might be a little easier than asking them to come to a meeting in, in Michigan. Two, there, there was a fair amount of, of uh, kind of personal outreach. Uh, Alan Pickerlow, the, the, my, my collaborator in this from UMass, he, I think he called probably... 40 out of 50 hospitals directly speaking to the, the nursing leadership or the medical leadership about the project, and, and that, I think, carried a lot of value. And then I'll just mention a third. A third, you know, since Massachusetts is a fairly small state, we, we also have the benefit that we know a lot of our colleagues at, at other hospitals, so, so the personal contacts at, at different hospitals helped as well. Thank you. Once again, if you would like to ask a question on the phone, please press star 1 and record your name at this time. I have a question for Dr. Gould. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Gould. Can you talk a little bit more about the, your collaboration with CPQCC and CMQCC mm. and sure. the databases and how you've been able to work together? So when we started CPQCC, it was perinatal, and the, and the reason, there were a couple of reasons for that. Uh, uh, M State MCH really felt it was important to have obstetrical input and to, and to have a perinatal collaborative. And, and when we put together uh, CPQCC, we had several uh, incredible uh, 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 maternal fetal medicine folks that, that formed the background of what we were doing. Elliot Main uh, was one, Lisa Course, uh, Kim Gregory, uh, you know, all highly recognized. Uh, and we really couldn't have done it without them. In fact, our very first uh, QI was antenatal steroids, which is uh, an obstetrical, you know, where, where you're tagging it obstetricians. Uh, as, we, as we proceeded, we realized that, that, that really the, that we were only uh, talking about 17,000 kids a, a year uh, out of 500,000, uh, 17,000 who are cared for in 132 NICUs rather than 500,000 cared for in about 290 delivery sites. And, and it became really clear that, that if we were going to improve the, the health of all uh, moms, that we really had to have a, 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 an organization that reached out to all of these uh, 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 b delivery sites and, uh, and looked at the kinds of problems that we were finding with our maternal fetal uh, uh, reviews, which are uh, toxemia, uh, hemorrhage, uh, uh, thrombosis, and embolism, etc. And so, what we decided to do was to create a uh, uh, the CMQCC that would address uh, uh, all of all of this. So, so that was that was done, and uh, and the first thing that uh, CMQCC tried to do is. Uh, is to really use green data. This green data is, you know, uh, taking birth certificates and uh, 
and uh, discharge summary data that hospitals uh, uh, do and then kind of throw out to, to agencies, uh, capturing it, combining it, and using it to uh, develop real-time or near-real-time public health and JCO measures for those hospitals. So, so, so we did that. One of the measures that, that uh, we, we worked on was antenatal steroids. And rather, you know, where to get that data? Well, we could get that data from the CPQCC data set. So we adjusted our uh, entry criteria to meet uh, JCO requirements. We went up to 32 weeks. And now we're starting to uh, feed uh, that information uh, back to, uh, uh, back to, the, to, to the maternal uh, folks. One of the things that we're concerned about as neonatologists is uh, morbidity in, in babies that uh, uh, may not necessarily come into the NICU. And so uh, CMQCC has a, a measure unexpected morbidity in a otherwise uncomplicated uh, uh, pregnancy, and, uh, pregnancy. And that's, uh, uh, we're planning to feed that back, uh, back uh, to, to us. Uh, eventually what we want to do is we really want to be able to have a linked data set uh, that can look at social issues via the census uh, tract, uh, then uh, uh, look at the health of the mom, see how that plays out in the, in the NICU, and then with high, high risk, see how that plays out at, uh, at three years of age. And, and so these linkages uh, uh, we're working on right now, and, uh, and we hope to be able to really uh, use this data to look at perinatal health. You know, we talk about perinatal health, but we only look at that segment that we're involved with. If we talk about perinatal health and we give you data from the NICU. We talk about perinatal health and we give you JCO uh, maternity data. We talk about perinatal health and we, and we, uh, and we give you uh, follow-up data, uh, but that follow-up data is never really related to the conditions of the mom. Uh, it's more like what happened in the intensive care unit. So, so that's where we're trying to go with this. I, I know we're going to we're going to uh, get there, uh, and uh, we're pretty excited about it. There's a lot of technical difficulty, but you know now uh, we we have a lot of experience in in terms of linking data and cleaning data. Uh, we're using a lot of administrative data, but we're partnering with the state. Uh, uh, and uh, trying to uh, work with the state on in-service uh, uh, to uh, birth certificate uh, uh, abstractors and developers. So, so th this is kind of our vision, uh, is to really build a, a perinatal database that will allow quality improvement along the continuum and to be able to, and to, be able to, to see how it plays out. But the one folks that we really, from this last discussion, that's really important uh, these primary care uh, uh, hospitals. And, uh, you know, all of our work to date is really based on uh, uh, centers of excellence and uh, in big hospitals. And, and, you know, truly we have no idea as to what are the needs and the structure of, a, of these small primary care hospitals. And one of the initiatives we're thinking of is to try to, to try to ask the question, what is a small community hospital center of excellence? What would it look like uh, in terms of its policies for uh, uh, referral, its policies for uh, simulation training, and, and other things uh, uh, that as primarily, uh, you know, regional center directors, we, we just don't have a real sense of we're hoping to really work with uh, some small community hospitals uh, to see what their needs are and to see if we could develop this concept of uh, a community hospital center of excellence and what it would take to support this in terms of quality training, et cetera. That was a long answer to a short question. Yeah, that was, that was a great answer. Thank you. And I also had one quick question for Dr. Gupta. You mentioned um, some collaborations with the state. Are you referring to um, their work with the Pell data set? Uh, exactly. That, yes. So the, the two data slides that I showed from um, EI referral rates and rehospitalizations uses the Pell data. Okay. Yeah. The, the Pell data for folks who are on the call is, is an is a impressive resource that the, the DPH has put together that combines 
several different data streams to provide a, a reasonably comprehensive data set looking at moms and babies until age three, and including information on hospitalizations and, and the birth. Yeah, I will say that I keep up. The DPH folks are, they've been, you know, terrific. They're, they're excited about this work. They've been doing a lot of the analyses. I think they're, they're very invested in, in the idea of supporting the, this type of QI work. Wonderful. Are, are there any other questions before we conclude? Well, I have a comment. Okay. <laughs> there are no other questions. Let's see if there's a question. Otherwise, I have a comment. We have no other questions at this time, sir. So, so I have a, this is a, for me personally, uh, participating in today's uh, uh, program was really important because uh, you might have noticed that there was a huge difference uh, between what's going on in California and what's going on in Massachusetts in some respects. In, the, in Massachusetts, it's a, it's, it's a, small, a, a smaller uh, venue and there's a lot of uh, uh, independent things that are going on, and the notion of, of quality, to me, seems to be putting out principles that, that these independent entities will, will use uh, and then sharing in terms of collaborative, uh, you know, community of learning, sharing some of these principles, but a lot of self-determination. Whereas in California, we kind of started off that way, but because it's such a big state, we, we really adopted the IHI very formal uh, way of doing things. I think both things work, and the reason that both things work, both approaches work, is that they're all built upon the foundation of data, the foundation of, of uh, uh, standardizing whatever process you decide, mm -hmm. standardizing it, and, and the foundation of auditing and monitoring not only your, your, your achievement, but also your adherence to these processes. So, so, so although on the surface it may seem that our approaches are quite different, the fundamental mm -hmm. principles of using data, monitoring process, uh, 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 and, and sharing in sharing insights in terms of a community of learning uh, are really, uh, we, we, we share these three uh, very, very key principles uh, for success, I think. What do you think, Manish? Yeah, I think that's a super important point, Dr. Gould. I would agree 100%. I think I tried to emphasize the, the difference in structure, but, but I think your point that the core principles remain the same throughout is, is very important. We have no further questions on the phone. Well, I, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity of sharing. Uh, folks that are interested in more in what's going on in California with either CPQCC or CMQCC, uh, just uh, Google us and uh, we have all kinds of information and all kinds of uh, free toolkits uh, uh, that are available. And uh, uh, if you ever want to come to our California Association of Neonatology uh, uh, annual conference, uh, uh, it's a great venue and a usually fabulous program in San Diego in the, in the spring. Thank you. Since there are no other questions, we'd like to thank Drs. Jeffrey Gould and Munish Gupta for giving us such an excellent presentation of neonatal quality improvement initiatives. We'd also like to thank you all for participating in this webinar and invite you to provide feedback about this presentation and this webinar series. We'll be contacting you after this webinar for your input. We hope that our webpage and this webinar series will facilitate exchange of information and promote visibility of perinatal quality improvement activities throughout the country. We encourage you to visit our webpage at www.cdc.gov forward slash reproductive health forward slash maternal infant health forward slash PQC to learn more about CDC support of perinatal quality improvement collaboratives. You can also contact us at the DRH info link at the bottom of the web page. Thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon. That does conclude today's conference call. We thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect and have a great rest.